welcome Ken Dodd. seen a Chippendale. Uh, well, I'd like to say, how tickled and how completely discombinocorated, how, how full of plumpishness to be here tonight, an audience with LWT, LWT, a long wait for a titter. <laughs> now, then, you know, oh, we've got, what an audience, we've got a special audience. Now, I think it'd be a good idea, we watch you coming in, you know, we watch, we peep through the curtains, we saw you all staggering along the South Bank, all using your inhalers. Uh, elastic stockings flapping in the breeze. I stand here now on this stage and look, can you imagine what's going through my mind? <laughs> what a challenge. <laughs> Honestly, I've seen happier looking bloodhounds. <laughs> I think it'd be a good idea now if all the ugly ones came down and sat near the front. <laughs> you have. Good. Well, this is that. As you know, folks, as a special. As a special concession, people with big ears were allowed in half price. <laughs> Congratulations, sir. <laughs> Do you know, I've been looking forward to this. I've been looking forward to you all day today. Give you an idea of the sort of life I live. <laughs> Five o'clock this morning in Naughty Ash, I flung the bedroom windows open, climbed in. <laughs> oh, what a beautiful day. What a beautiful day for doing something, doing something wild and sporty, like ramming a brush stave up Nigel Mansell's trousers and saying, how's this for pole position? <laughs> Taking all your clothes off, strapping your legs around the back of your neck and shouting, How's this for an oven ready turkey? <laughs> ready when you are, Bernard Matthews. Yes. <laughs> what a beautiful day for going up to a kilted Scotsman standing over a puddle and saying, I see it's a full moon again, Jock. <laughs> <laughs> Just to think, to think, we're all going to spend the next seven and a half hours listening to stuff. Right? Right? Oh, oh, yes, we are. Oh, yes, we are. Oh, yes, we are, Mrs. You said you could do it and you wrote in. You see, time, ladies and gentlemen, time, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter to me. This is the way I look at it. <laughs> time matters not one jot. Let's all say that together. Time matters not one jot. Time matters not one jot. I'll ask you again in about six hours' time. There's, there's one thing about my shows, folks, you always go home in the daylight. This, this studio has all been completely computerized. Oh, yes, we've all gone digital. <laughs> yes, all your statistics and personal details are on, noted on this computer. When you came in through the security... Hang on, I'll just get it for you. This, <clears throat> when you. When you come in this evening, you are past, you walk through a security screen. Oh, yes, yes, you've actually... Did, did, you, did you feel a tingle as you came in? <laughs> It should have gone right through to your corsets. This... You did. Well, come and see me after the show. Ah, just make sure you're properly earthed. This... Here are all the computer statistics of our audience here at LWT. In the audience, somewhere there, we've got seven bricklayers, six carpet fitters, two taxi drivers, and a double glazing salesman. There he is over there talking to himself. <laughs> You'll notice that you're all wearing barcodes, badges, barcodes. You know, you know, barcodes are those those little patterns you see stuck on packets of frozen sprouts. <laughs> yeah. This. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry I looked at you then, so I'm. <laughs> now what? What does your barcode tell me about you, sir? You, sir. You, sir. The gentleman there. You, sir. You take a size ten in hats. You have a bunion on your left big toe and a cocker spaniel called Eric. <laughs> Your hobbies are writing rude words on steamed-up car windows and taking your trainers off in crowded lifts. <laughs> it was your birthday last week and all your friends clubbed together and bought you an old-fashioned bed warmer. A 68-year-old chorus girl. <laughs> are you all in a good mood? Yeah. Good, good. Now, right now, I've got to, I need your support. I need the loyal oath. Could we have the loyal oath, please? Could we, hands on your hearts, please. Everybody, hands on your hearts. Yes, your own heart, if you don't matter. <laughs> 
Everybody, no, everybody in the suit, repeat after me. We the audience. We the audience. At LWT. At LWT. Solemnly swear. Solemnly swear. That we will never, ever, ever. Never, ever, ever. Repeat or reveal. Any of the new jokes kept on my television. Now that's enough. Come on, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What the galaxy does. The last time I saw so many stars was when I banged my head on the mangle. Yes. <laughs> Our first star question tonight comes from the lovely Hannah Gordon, an actress of many parts, all of them in beautiful condition. <laughs> Hannah Gordon. Are you there, Hannah? Yes, I'm here. Ken, I would like to ask you if you actually came from a show business background. Were you a, were you a funny child? Oh, <laughs> 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 well, listen, when I, when I was a little baby, I'd like to tell you a story of my life, if you've got five or six hours to spare. No, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, I'll tell you the story of my life. When, when I was, I'm gonna say something now. <laughs> I'm gonna say something now, ladies and gentlemen, that I, you're gonna be flabbergasted. Really, you will. You, you, you'll say, my, my, we can hardly believe that. <laughs> I, I wasn't a pretty baby. <laughs> my, my. Oh, come on, be a bit more convincing, will you? No, I was plain. No, I was plain. I was plain. I had embroidered on my bib this way up. <laughs> I, I, was, I was an ugly baby. Very ugly. I was the only baby in the street whose dummy had a 12-inch flange. <laughs> <laughs> my father put shutters on my pram. <laughs> my, dad, my dad knew I was going to be a comedian. When I was a baby, he said, is this a joke? <laughs> <laughs> I was a bottle baby. Then one day I pushed a cork out and escaped. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know I could walk when I was six months old? My granny opened the front door and said, go on, hop it. <laughs> when they took me out of my pram, people used to flock for miles. They thought it was a mobile Punch and Judy show. And, <laughs> and that's how I started to show. I came into show business. I was with John Hansen in the Desert Song. I was second hump on the camel. And <laughs> for a while, I was Albert Tatlock's stuntman. And <laughs> At the age of eight, I had my own flea circus until my mother stopped me playing with the lad next door. Then... <laughs> I'm... <laughs> I'm ready for another question, ladies and gentlemen. And over here we have a very distinguished British actor of stage and film, James Fox. Can I be blunt? No, of course, you were. No, sorry. <laughs> That's brilliant. Ken, I've read that's your ambition to play every live theatre in the country. Do you have a favourite theatre? Yes, I do. They're all, all my theatres, I'm sure, like yourself. All theatres are beautiful. These, there's the temples of show business, of course, in London. There's the Palladium, and there's beautiful theatres in the north, in Blackpool and Newcastle and Scotland. Is, th is there anybody in from the north? Yeah. Anybody in from Lancashire? Yeah. Uh, well, you'll recognise track when you see it. <laughs> <laughs> anybody in from Yorkshire? Yeah. Oh, heck, you know, they always sit near the door. That's in case there's a collection. <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing wrong with Yorkshire folk, is there? Yorkshire born, Yorkshire bred, strong in the arm. As I say, you have been... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have, we have a very distinguished gentleman here on the front row in evening dress and trainers. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Are you a professional gentleman, sir? Are you an architect, sir? Surveyor? Doctor? Pardon? A, a bin man. I see. Right. Well, could, <laughs> could I ask you rather a personal question, sir? And I wouldn't embarrass you, I realise, with this lovely lady. What night of the week is your bath night, sir? What, not your bath? Well, no, he looks, uh, looks, looks a nice man. Uh, well, night, uh, yes, do you have to most think about nights, it? really, about three or, three or four nights a week. Three or four, fell on the front way, has a bath, three or four nights a week. Yeah. Are, you, are you in some kind of an institution, sir? Are you, <laughs> this lady, is this matron? Uh, <laughs> the lady in the safari jacket and the Doc Martins. Why, <laughs> why are you having so many baths? I mean, what are you looking for? You won't find it, not unless they've got a big nurse. <laughs> <laughs> When, when you have these, uh, these three or four baths a week, so do, you, do you have them all over, or does she just sit you on the draining board and go as far as you need? <laughs> and, and when you get out of the bath, are you like most men? Do you have a quick flex? Uh, I bet you do. You're a big lad. Eh? I, bet, I bet you're up in that bathroom for hours. Uh, is he, Mrs? Eh? For hours? Yes? yes. Posing. Posing in front of the, the long, full-length mirror. Eh? Bragging. Shouting downstairs. Gladys! <coughs> Gladys! Come and look at this! <coughs> Hurry up! Do, do you use any male 
cosmetics or any of this uh, fa fa a fa foo a fa fee a fa fa <laughs> Pledge! Oh, that's good. Oh, great. Oh, oh, she's bound to take a shine to you now. <laughs> Oh, this, 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 this is an educational show, you know. When you go out to be here tonight, you say, well, that's taught me a lesson. <laughs> Let's have a question from my, from my favourite Frenchman, ladies and gentlemen. All I can say is, thank heaven he's English. From, from uh, hello, 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 Mr Gordon Kay. Okay. Uh, with respect, you have a curious mind. How would you... <laughs> how would you describe your kind of comedy? Well, uh, yeah, well, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, well, <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> yes, Because yes. I am, you know, I am an, I, I am an optimist. And, and we have lots of optimists in the audience here tonight. They're the ones who book taxis for 11 o'clock. <laughs> to ponder. I'm fond of a pond, you know. I mean, ask myself questions like, why does the tomcat always decide to lick itself just as you're having your supper? This, well, well, here's another one you won't like. You tell me. How is it? <clears throat> On a Sunday evening, you're in the house. Okay, you're in the house. You, you, you've just had your tea. You're full of chunks. And, and well, all right then. Chinese passion fruit. But uh, you, you're in the house. You, you, you've just... Uh, you, you've had a little trifle in the afternoon, and now you're having your tea. And you just... <laughs> You just bung in a shovel full of blancmange, you switch the television set on, and that fellow's there, James Herriot. Now, exactly, exactly. <laughs> he does the same blessed thing every week. Where's he getting all the cows from? That's right, like, no. <laughs> there can't be that many poorly cows in Yorkshire, sure. <laughs> you're in the, having your tea, you're bunging in a shovel full of blancmange, and he's going, come on, me old beauty. <laughs> and an amazed cow's going, mmm. He deserves a pat on the head for that. Uh, <laughs> are there any are there any farmers in here tonight? Any farmers in? Yes. I thought so. You can always you can always tell when there's farmers in when they're showing their wives to their seats. Say, come on, there's a girl. Come on. Come on. I love anything like that, because anything intellectual like I love, because I am an intellectual entertainer. You know? Oh, yeah, intellectual entertainer. At one time, there was only Noel Coward and me doing this sort of stuff. Oh, oh. But once he packed the accordion up, that was it. I was in like a shot. And I do draw, rather like a mustard blaster. I do... Um, <coughs> when I was a little lad, in my weed, <coughs> when, I, when I walk down the street, people think I'm following them with an accordion. But when I was, when I was a little boy... My, my old granny, she used to, when I go to school, she used to stick a mustard, mustard plaster on my chest before I went to school. It was embarrassing. All the other kids used to wipe their ham sandwiches on me. <laughs> this. <laughs> but there are, it, this is a very intellectual audience here tonight. In here, in here tonight, there's an IQ of about 188. <laughs> Between them, of course. This. <laughs> hey, I got some marvellous education news last week. Huh? Last week, what day? It was Tuesday. Tuesday this week, I came downstairs to get the post, which is a good trick in a bungalow. And <laughs> I, I picked it up, and I found they've informed me by letter, by letter that I've, I've won a prize in the Reader's Digest draw. No, 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 no! I've nearly won a prize in the Reader's Digest. Not only that, but my name was specially selected from all the other people. I think. Oh, you're actually looking at a person who's going through to stage two. <laughs> And I'm going to America with Hoover. Yes. I may be going to Scunthorpe with Electrolux, but I don't know. That isn't confirmed. <laughs> Even a marvellous magazine, folks, the Reader's Digest. A mine of useless... I like, I like reading the... I love reading the medical articles. I'm potty anything medical. I wasn't always. I used to think a placebo was a Spanish singer. But this... <laughs> Here's one of it you didn't know. Did you know that a dog whistle is so high, a dog whistle is so high, the human ear all can't possibly hear it? Your dog's probably sitting at home now in the kitchen, whistling his blooming head up. <laughs> and you're just sitting here in LWT, laughing hysterically. <laughs> ish, ish, ish. <laughs> well, I bet, bet when you get back home tonight, you know, your dog will be in the kitchen, your dog will say to you, I've been sitting in the kitchen all night, whistling my head up. <laughs> you haven't taken a blind bit of notice. Anyway, the back door was bolted, so there it is. This, this, this... <laughs> What's that, man? You're not bothered because you've got a cat flap. Oh, absolutely. Do you mean personally or at home? 
to do to the cats, because that's how we'll find our way back home tonight, though, or tomorrow morning, whenever this seminar finishes. The... <laughs> not following a ginger tom. No, I'm talking about the cat's eyes. The cat's eyes in the centre of the road. The cat's eyes in the centre... This is rather pleasant, this. The cat's eyes... <laughs> And that was a Yorkshireman who invented that, you know, the cat's eyes by accident. One night you see this Yorkshireman, he's driving home at night in his big posh car in the dark, and suddenly, suddenly, in the car's headlamps, he sees these cat's eyes coming towards him. Now, had the cat been walking the other way, it would have invented the pencil sharpener. <laughs> but there you are. And these are new cats. Well, remember where you heard it first. Because, because knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. What is knowledge? Power. Have you got the knowledge? Yes. Then you've got the power. Isn't it wonderful to be in control? <laughs> this thing isn't working again, you know? <laughs> We have another brilliant British actor, ladies and gentlemen, in the audience. Uh, a wonderful man, Mr Martin Jarvis. <laughs> he was in the famous film Chariots of Fire. He played a wingnut. <laughs> <laughs> His biggest success of all was in the famous West End play, The Burfoot Contessa, when he played a Veruca. <laughs> this... <laughs> What's on your mind, Martin, besides libel? <laughs> Well, talking of plays, Ken, you had uh, success, I believe, when you played Malvolio in Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, and yeah. I wonder, have you any further plans to appear <coughs> in straight plays? Yeah, yes, well, you know, you know what it's like, son. You can't get the plays, can you? They're not writing, are they? No. <laughs> Where are, are the great plays still being written, Martin? You know? Well, there you well, are. Well, we must do it ourselves, then, must we? Eh? Why not? Well, why not? Let's write, a, like, write, let's write a play tonight, couldn't we? We could write a play between us, couldn't we? Yeah. We, we, we call the right people. If, well, if we put our heads together, we could make a plank. We could... <laughs> now, shall I, be the, shall I be the hero of the... Because I come from a long line of heroes. Oh, along my, my uncle Sidney, he had a military bearing, which he used to juggle and make the kids laugh with. But this... <laughs> <laughs> yes? <laughs> my uncle Eustace, he deserted during the military two-step, and my... <laughs> my grandfather was, had a lot to do with the relief of Lady Smith. Yes, as a matter of fact, she invited him back the following night. So... <laughs> or shall I be the villain? Shall I do... What do you think, the villain? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I could be a villain. I could be a villain. I could sue. Honestly. Well, I could do some villainous things, you know. At the end of the month, I always go down to the bottom of the garden, wait until the tortoise gets there, then turn it round the other way. <laughs> I can do some pretty swinish things, you know. When it's pouring with rain, I love to ask policemen the time when they're wearing their bike capes. <laughs> I close my eyes in the middle of wedding photographs. And, <laughs> and when I'm at home, I deliberately leave the seat up. Yes. <laughs> Half past ten at night, I always get the dog's lead down from behind the door and then don't go out. <laughs> but, now, now, this play is based on the film Futile Attraction. And, <laughs> you know, you've seen it, Futile Attraction, and there's this woman, she's obsessed by me. Naturally, of course. I, I am a matterly idol. I, I do very little in the evenings as well. This... <laughs> this woman... This woman, she's a psychopath. I realise that when I see her riding her bike on the pavement. <laughs> and she's... Uh, <laughs> please. Come on, you got in for nothing. This. <laughs> there I am. There I am in the south of France, Monte Carlo, playing dominoes at Prince Rainier. I say, are you knocking, Your Highness? <laughs> I go back to my beautiful French villa. I'm sitting in bed in my Austin Reed pyjamas. Sitting there, on the waterbed. Last night we left it switched on and we were nearly poached. <laughs> I say we, oui, because now I have this beautiful, tall French girl. She's standing on the balcony, framed in the French windows. The moonlight is dancing in her hair. The moonlight dancing in her hair. <laughs> oh, and then her, her. <laughs> she's, wearing, she's wearing a Diphanius nighty. Um, it's a, it's a fashion term, sir. I got that out of a lady out of a magazine. Diphanius, it means, means semi-shufty. Uh, <laughs> Droll, like buying a ham shank at the co-op, you know, wrapped in mutton cloth. It looks very tasty, but you can't quite get at it. This, <laughs> she's, I, could, I could murder a bowl of cornflakes, and that's when I realised she's a serial killer. And let's... <laughs> Let's have another question, ladies and gentlemen, from one of my one of my favourite glamour girls tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Molly Sugden. If you uh, had the opportunity.
opportunity to be have a really good part in a feature film. Oh yes, yes, yes. But it meant taking off your clothes. How <laughs> <laughs> you do it? Well, I I do have a good part for that sort of uh, work. I don't know, Smolly. Have you, do you don't watch films like that, do you? Have you, have you, have you got a satellite dish? Do you want, <laughs> have, you try, have you tried Channel 27? <laughs> yeah, it's all got channel blocked, but you, you can't see them, but you can hear them. Eh? Ooh, ah, he, ooh, oh. I think they must be lifting a very heavy wardrobe. <laughs> I saw one of those continental uh, sexy films the other night. It was a Swedish film, and this, uh, in this film, this couple, this man and this lady, they were, they were wrestling, you know. They were, well, I think they were wrestling. They were all, they were all shiny. They, they, I think they'd been rubbing themselves with treks. Um, <laughs> and uh, the subtitles, just so you can understand the plot. Uh, <laughs> he says to her, he said, more smuggy to get off some more. Well, what have you done? She said, well, much good to go for the 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 go the go for the go the go the go for 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 the go the go for the go for the go for the go the go for the Miss Carol Vorderman. Such, such a brilliant intellect. She can do Chinese takeaways in her head. <laughs> Carol, we both share the same love of mathematics. Yes. And I, <laughs> after the show, I'd like to present you with a copy of my new book, Teach Yourself Accountancy. <laughs> I mean, based on my personal experience, it's called The Mysterious World of Numbers. <laughs> Back, back, back to front. Yet I'm heavily into science and also science fiction, and not a lot of people know this, but you once appeared in Doctor Who, did you not? Doctor Who, yes. 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 Are you heavily into science fiction? Oh, yes. I mean, sci fi, yes. Mm. Oh, yes. I saw this science fiction film in our house the other night. It was all about this, it was all about this astronaut. This astronaut, he <laughs> shot out in space. He went three times around the galaxy. He brought the spacecraft back to Earth. He swooped low off of the Bernard Manning Memorial Sewage Farm. <laughs> 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 This astronaut he shot up into space, as I say, he, and, 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 and he looked through the porthole, porthole window, and he couldn't believe his eyes because he was a hundred years into the future. A oh, hundred years in the future, and everything on Earth had changed. There were no roadworks on the M6. Don't let you go too far. <laughs> Not on the M6, you won't. Uh, <laughs> our show this evening, ladies and gentlemen, is graced by the presence of a renowned concert artiste. A star of many platforms, as those of you who travel from King's Cross or St. Pancras will know. <laughs> Dame Hilda Brackett. Kenneth, dear, a, a delight to be able to ask you a question. <laughs> so, now look at me when I'm talking. <laughs> so, <laughs> Has your voice been uh, trained? And <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you ever uh, nurture a wish to go into grand opera? You do so well, dear. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Timberlake. Well, actually, Timberlake, I have had my voice trained. They put newspapers down for it. And uh, I... <laughs> I can actually cover five octaves. I've had my legs stretched. <laughs> I don't know about opera, I don't know, because opera is very confusing. Opera is where a man gets stabbed and instead of bleeding, he sings. So... <laughs> now, I... I do like that. I like singing. I think singing makes you happy. And I like, I like happy songs. And you like happy songs, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. So, maestro, have you any ha-ha music? Ha-ha, <laughs> ha-ha. Come on, girls. Here we go. Ha-ha. <laughs> Mrs, are you laughing at something I've said or something he's done? I can't take credit for another lad's work. <laughs> when I'm calling you <laughs> Will you answer? Stop the car! <laughs> Just one! 
Love 
screen here tonight. Just like a clinic. This... <laughs> friends, because I feel I can call you friends now. Oh. Not for much longer. Friends. <laughs> Tonight, see, tonight, tonight's Ticklemas Eve. Tonight's Ticklemas Eve and tomorrow's Ticklemas Day. I've had them especially re-fluffed for you tonight, love. Yeah? Oh, bloody you're going to get it. Uh, Ticklemas Eve. This is why I'm wearing my hurry furry coat. Genuine moggy skin, this lady. It's moggy skin, pussycats. Took 28 moggies to make this. <laughs> All Toms. Uh, she's full of life, this coat. <laughs> I've got a pair of underpants made of the same stuff. Moggy skin, long johns. When I walk down our street, people say, Ah, oh, hurry comes. <laughs> It's a joke. I, well, that's definitely a joke. It is a joke. I recognise them. That's uh, that's what we, what we professional humorists, what we call a shaft of wit. And this is well, that's something similar, sir. This. this right. This. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've got a, I've got a, a gentleman in the audience, ladies and gentlemen, over here. Give uh, my respect. <laughs> You, you get these suits by sending away the tops of 12 birds crusted packets. <laughs> a young man over here, ladies and gentlemen, a man who works miracles. The world's greatest wizard, Paul Daniels. <laughs> Paul Daniels, a magician who is so small, the rabbit keeps dragging him back into the hat. <laughs> Daniels, he's, he's working very hard now on his most spectacular and difficult illusion, how to make David Copperfield disappear. <laughs> Paul, amaze me with your question. What's that old basket doing on the stage? I'm trying to get laughs. <laughs> this here, this, this is a prop basket, as you know, Paul. You would probably be born in one of these, a much smaller one, of course. This, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> this is, a, is a, an old prop basket. It's full of props. Comics, all comics love props. Here, for instance, here's the, here's the jester's cowl. Now, the jesters all wore these in the, like the fools of the Middle Ages, as opposed to a Middle Aged fool. And they. <laughs> <laughs> a comical effect. The ladies are laughing already. This. <laughs> they know it reminds them of a donkey. This. <laughs> sometimes I wish it was a donkey. <laughs> Only sometimes, but this. You see, the jester had a fool's license. You know, he could do anything he liked. He used to go around hitting the king and all the noblemen over the head with his bladder. And it was very funny if he'd been, <laughs> if he'd been on the lager the night before. This. <laughs> Yes, all this, this is a slapstick. Two pieces of wood, see? Slap, and that's a jester's. This is, that's where the, uh, the expression comes from, the slapstick. And uh, the red hot poker, one ball of that. This, <laughs> this is my favourite prop. This is the great drum of Naughty Ash. A eh? little bit of classical music. Come and join us, silent night. Softly, softly. Oh, I love a drum. You can't beat them. Well, you have to, actually. <laughs> I never go anywhere without my drum. I love dashing into Tesco's and shouting, I want Fortin's off! <laughs> the special offers I've had. And in, 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 in an in emergency. I mean, supposing, for instance, supposing you, ladies and gentlemen, were, were, you, 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 were, you were in a, a strange hotel at you, in, in London. I, 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 know, I know we've found one. And you... <laughs> You find yourself in a strange world, and it's in the middle of the night, and it's pitch dark, and you don't know where you are, and you can't see the time. Well, stick your drum out of the bedroom window. <laughs> go on, love, you've got a beauty. Uh, pull your drum out and go. Somebody always shouts, Who the hell's playing a drum at half past three in the morning? <laughs> so, we, we have a very, a very glamorous young lady here on, on the front line. A gorgeous girl who you can definitely count on. Well, up to two, anyway. This, <laughs> Miss Samantha Fox. Is here. Hello. <laughs> Ask me anything you like. <clears throat> okay. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Don't worry. <laughs> my 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 question is rather personal, really. Um, oh. Oh. I'd like to know where your tickle stick idea comes from, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Samantha, yes. A lot of people think, you know, the, the, the tickling stick is a sex symbol, but I think it's a fallacy. And I... It's a 
jester's prop. It is, it's a jester's prop. Now, we've got another man here. We've got a man here who became the long-suffering husband of Hyacinth Bucket. And he's been dying to kick her ever since. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome Mr Clive Swift. Uh, Ken, uh, you are known as the professor of ticklology. Oh. Uh, and you, you've studied the psychology of humour. So please could you tell me, because I've been wanting to know all my life, yes. uh, what is a laugh? <laughs> what is a laugh? Well, a laugh, uh, well, anatomically speaking, a laugh starts here in the middle of your diagram. It <laughs> works its way across through your clack and out through your titter bulb. It's very like an attack of wind, actually, but it's... A laugh is a noise that comes out of a hole in your face. <laughs> Anywhere else, you're in dead trouble. But people, people laugh at all sorts of things. Some ladies laugh at little things. It's a pity, really, but there you are. It's... <laughs> but for thousands of years, philosophers and psychologists, they've all tried to find the secret, the secret spring of laughter. Aristotle said that the nub of laughter was a buckled mill wheel. That is to say, life out of true. All the great, uh, great philosophers, Schopenhauer, Kant, Bergson, Freud said that the essence of the comic was the conservation of psychic energy. But then again, Freud never played second house Friday night at Glasgow Empire. <laughs> this, I think, I think, I think, ladies and gentlemen, there is a rainbow of laughter. A, real, a rainbow of laughter. At the very, very top, there's the laughter of pure joy. White, if you like, and you can hear that any time you like, for free. You just pass any school playground and you see little children leaping and jumping around for the sheer joy of being alive. And then you go right through the, right through the rainbow, through the different laughs, pink laughter, green laughter, blue laughter, and right at the very bottom, there's the dark colours of sarcasm, insult, satire. And that's, I think, laughter, a sense of humour, is the sense of seeing the funny side of life. I mean, people say, do funny things happen on the way to the theatre? No. A, a, pal, a friend of mine, was John Farrow, the producer, he had this marvellous idea to have a play written for him called Page Three Girls. It was an, ex it was an excuse for you to get young ladies to take their clothes off. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the only night was at the Theatre Royal Hanley. And the, page Three Girls. Place was packed. <laughs> the lights come down in the auditorium. Complete blackout. And from the back, a little pin, I think it's called a pin focus line, went, like that, and hit the front of the stage. The curtains parted and out stepped this beautiful girl, not a stitch on, but a lovely 20 year old, not a perfect, beautiful body, as naked as the day she was born. And she went up to the microphone and she said, Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention? <laughs> We've got a man over here, later on. Uh, we've got a wonderful man over here who looks like Father Christmas with an attitude. It's, <laughs> it's Warren Mitchell. I'd like to know, uh, when, you, when you first came into this mad business of ours, did, were there any... Did you have a, uh, a comedian, a comic, who, who was a, a hero that you wanted to model yourself on? I did indeed one. I, I modelled myself, and I was very lucky, because I had great heroes to look up to. Wonderful, wonderful comedians of, of uh, 40 and 50 years ago. Arthur Askey, Ted Ray, Max Miller, the great Max. Yeah, and Arthur Askew was my, well, as a child, Arthur Askew was, he was, he was a wonderful man. It was, like, it was like a firework display going off. He, was, he had so much energy. And the greatest stand-up comic of them all was Ted Ray. What a wonderful man. <laughs> He's had such, such charm, sophistication. I think the most lovable, the most lovable of all our great draws must have been Rob Wilton when he said, the day, the day war broke out, the wife said to me, she said, why are you wearing that ridiculous uniform? He said, well, we're gu I'm guarding the White Cliffs of Dover in case we have get invaded. She said, what, you? Oh, no, he said, there's five or six of us. He said, why are you wearing that ridiculous home guard uniform? He said, I've told you, he said, in case Hitler invades the White Cliffs of Dover. She said, well, how will you know it's him? If you said you were in case Hitler invades, then how will you know it's Hitler? Well, he said, well, he said I've got a tongue in my head, haven't I? <laughs> and that is great comedy, thank you. Thank you. People say, where are all the new comedians? Where are all the new comedians going to come from? 
Well, I'm, I'm going I'm to introduce you now to a, a great new comic, a great new comic star from Merseyside. He's over here, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mickey Finn. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Where do all the comedians come from, Liverpool? Well, Arthur Askey said you've got to be a comedian to live in Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> I love all the accent. Now, that's a, isn't that a lovely Liverpool accent? No, I don't like it. But the thing about a Liverpool accent, we can be understood just about. <laughs> British accents, uh, down in the West Country, that's where they say, hello, my dear, hello, my flower, hello, my lover. And that's the men to each other. <laughs> Here's a lovely West Country lass, Pam Ayres. You're a long way from the country, Pam. You must be free range. Uh, Ken, I've often heard that um, if you tell a joke in the form of a poem or a, a verse, it works better um, as, a, as a poem. What do you think about that? Well, I would just say, who are? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, I'd be like, yes, I think so, yes, I think uh, it's, the, it's the rhythm, isn't it, the rhyme. It seems to help the, uh, the humour along. There was a, a marvellous comic called Billy Bennett, another Mercy like Billy Bennett, who had fabulous monologues like this one, this one. Hmm. A sailor's farewell to his horse. Uh, <laughs> it was a dirty night, it was a dirty trick when our ship turned over in the Atlantic. <laughs> it was the schooner Hesperus, we all lay asleep in our bunks, bound for a cruise where they don't have reviews with a cargo of elephant's trunks. The sea was as smooth as a baby's top lip. Not even a policeman in sight. And the little sardines had climbed into their tins and pulled down the lids for the night. <laughs> Said old Bosun Brown, the ship's going down, and I'm sure that we'll never reach Blighty. It's women and children first, cried the mate. So I put on the old woman's nighty. <laughs> I said to a girl, you must swim for your life. Or cling on to a boy, if you can. She looked at me coy. She said, you're not a boy. Get off, you're a dirty old man. <laughs> Thank you. In the audience, we're very lucky to have one of our best comedy talents, the lovely Josie Lawrence. <laughs> Josie, what's, what's your line anyway? Uh, okay, in these days of uh, sexual equality, um, <laughs> there's still uh, more male comedians than, than female comedians now. Would you agree that uh, women can be as funny as men? As <laughs> funny? I know some very funny women. <laughs> I mean, women are definitely funny. Only a woman would think of going to bed at night wearing a mud pack, <laughs> hair in curlers, and then say, where's all the passion gone? <laughs> Only a woman on a Saturday night would think of hoovering when you're trying to listen to the football results. <laughs> Liverpool 4, Arsenal... <laughs> I see over here, ladies and gentlemen, my, my dear friend, my dear old friend. I, I don't know whether I can coax him into asking a question because... <laughs> he's so modest and shy <laughs> and humble. <laughs> Mr. Frank Carson. Well, I, I just thought, uh, uh, Doddy, have you <laughs> have you ever thought of being uh, politically minded? And are you politically correct? Well, we've both got brilliant minds, Frank. <laughs> He's right. He's right. <laughs> I have thought of going into politics. Oh, yes, I have. As a matter of fact, I, to be honest, the job I fancy is Chancellor of the Exchequer. Oh, <laughs> because. No, I do. Well, at least I'd be reunited with my money. <laughs> but I. Frank. Frank, I refuse to tell ethnic jokes. This fellow went into a, a pet shop in Liverpool last week and he said, Have you got any of them there, butchery you got? <laughs> How is it? Have you any of your payment off little green and yellow fellas? <laughs> he was from West Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
pet shot on us, the pet shot on us. He said, yeah, yeah, he said, we've got some budgies. He said, how much are the, how much are the little beggars? How, how much do you want them? He said, they're ten pounds. He said, ten pounds. He said, ten pounds. He said, that's what I said, ten pounds. He said, yeah, how many you got? He said, I've got a hundred. Right, he said, I'll take the lot. So he put a grand on the counter. He said, put them in an old cardboard box with some holes in his head and uh, I'll take them back with him. And when he got home, he had this beautiful waistcoat made. Oh, Frank, you're beautifully turned out. But this, uh, <laughs> a waist, it's a lovely, it was on cut moquette. It started here on the shoulders and went right down to his ankles. And it was, you've seen Joseph and his technical, well, it was nicer than that. And all the way down, they had these pockets. There was two pockets here, two pockets, two pockets, two pockets, two pockets. And he put a little budgie in every pocket, you see? I put, in every pocket, every, yeah, every pocket had a little budgie in. And a curious little bird, you know, they're lovely little things. They kept popping their little heads out and, and waggling their little beaks. <laughs> you do it for me, dear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God! <laughs> He got on the train at Liverpool and uh, uh, went down to London. Got off at Euston, walked all the way to the post office tower, climbed to the top and jumped off. Yes. The waistcoat, the budgie, him from Liverpool to London, walked, trudged all the way to the GPO tower, clambered his way to the very, very, very top and hurled himself into space. Well, he just went <laughs> on the deck. One of his pals rushed on. He said, Paddy, Paddy, what the hell are you trying to do? Oh, yes, I'll tell you one thing, he said. That budgie jumping is a waste of money time. <laughs> Over here, we have Scotland's answer to Les Patterson. <laughs> Rab C. Nesbitt. The... <laughs> Rab C. Nesbitt, the Jimmy Knapp of show business. <laughs> but he's really a wonderful, fine, versatile actor, Gregor Fisher. Um, the question I'd, li I'd like to ask you is about... Um playing all different theatres up and down the length and breadth of the land. You've played in theatres in the south and the north and even the far north. You've mentioned uh, Glasgow Empire. Is there, do people laugh at different things depending on where you are in the country? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, even far, uh, further north than that, Gregor. I've been to the, the Shetlands. They found a little theatre called the Garrison Theatre up there. I went up to the Shetlands. I have, I've got what they call a giggle map of Great Britain. And if you look at a map of Great Britain, you see all the... It's a wonderful country, not it? This, this big of Britain, this septic isle set in a silver sea. <laughs> it is, and everybody's sense of humour different reason. You can tell a joke in Edinburgh and they won't laugh in London. They can't hear it. <laughs> this, no, you can't... No, no, please, no. It's, all beautiful seaside resorts we go to with palm trees and people playing kazoos and grass skirts. Where have we been like that? Oh, witness. Yes, this is witness. <laughs> witness. The only town in Britain where they grow brown daffodils. <laughs> Sail up the coast of Britain past Southport, and have yet, if you're ever thinking of going to Southport, come and see me first, because I know a man who knows his way to the sea. <laughs> this... <laughs> I think, of course, you are from Southport. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> you go, I'm, I'm, it's a, such a thrill in Southport to go paddling outside the three mile limit. <laughs> this... <laughs> I was mugged there once by Lawrence of Arabia. I... <laughs> Keep going north up to Bonnie, Scotland. Hi, the Nicky New, when you get tickled in the Trossachs. I... <laughs> Glasgow was once voted City of Culture, wasn't it, Gregor? Glasgow, City of Culture, you get mugged in French. See, I... <laughs> fool, Jimmy. I... <laughs> Wild, exciting city class. They used to have street fights every night. No more street fights now. Now they call them pavement debates. <laughs> <laughs> Back down again, the east coast of England, down to Scarborough here, Scarborough. Very ever so hilly in Scarborough. Oh, late at night in the summertime, Scarborough. See all the old age pensioners going back to their digs, all roped together. It's like, oh, I'm going to... <laughs> The Midlands, now you'd think the Midlands, being the engine room of Britain, you'd think the Midlands would be... But it isn't. It, it, no, it isn't. Midlands, lovely, beautiful, and they've most lovely people there. Up in the northwest, our heroes are Pat and Mick. Well, now, in the Midlands, it's Enoch and Eli. They, <laughs> yeah, two fellas called Enoch and Eli. He said, where y'all been, are Eli? <laughs> where y'all been, are Eli? Where have you been to, Eli? He said, I've been fishing in the coot. Is he fishing? Did you catch anything? Who are? He said, I caught a whale. He said, Oh, caught a whale? What did you do with it? He said, I chucked it back in again. There were no spokes in it. <laughs> um, the Midlands. In the Midlands, you have Stratford, of course, with 
Willie Shakespeare, a man invented our business, didn't he? Willie Shakespeare, a man of a few words like myself. He <laughs> married to Anne Hathaway. She was the first Avon lady. <laughs> now, but in those days, I mean, not Stratford now, it's all ashtrays and egg timers, but in those days, <laughs> Stratford's all little, little wooden houses with, with thatched roofs. They had a, an awful lot of fires. Luckily, most of the men were heavy drinkers. And all Brit in Britain has a story to tell. I mean, please, like Harrow, for instance. Harrow. Now, Harrow is named after a Japanese word of greeting. Harrow. <laughs> and then, of course, there's our capital, London. London. Wasn't always the capital, you know. Wasn't always the capital. At one time, Britain was divided into two parts. I'm talking about BC, before Coronation Street. <laughs> Up north, we, we had, that was ours, we were, we, Lancashire, we were the roundheads and the squareheads. And down south, they had the cavaliers. They're the ones with the velvet knickerbockers and the lace ruffs and the long wavy hair right down to their waist. Their patron saint was St. Francis of Sissy. Well, <laughs> up north, we, we were governed, we were governed by King Dick of Wigan. <laughs> yeah, Buckingham Palace in those days was in Plank Lane in Lee. And, <laughs> King Dick of Wigan. King Dick of Wigan, he was the pretender to the throne. He used to go around saying, I'm not really the king. <laughs> I just like waving. <laughs> yeah. He was arrested. Now, matters came to a head at the Battle of Watford Gap, behind the service area. This... Imagine the, the tactics. The, the, the cavaliers, Velvet Nicholas, they'd been hiding on the roof of the little chef for three days. <laughs> I'm trying to get sick. And, uh, so, me, go into battle with two bottles, not me, I'm wash and go. <laughs> the air was filled with the sound of whistling and ricocheting black buttons, and then the Yorkshire Square Edge used the ultimate weapon, the mushy pea bomb. <laughs> There's always a terrible fallout. When they transferred the match to Stamford Bridge, and then on, where they drew 3-0, and then on to the Battle of Hastings, and we all know the picture there, the Battle of Hastings, clash of sword upon sword, King Harold sitting bravely on his white charger, an arrow stuck in his eye. All his courtiers gathered around him saying, Keep blinking, H, it'll work its way out. <laughs> Have you tried blowing your nose? Yes. <laughs> In the north of England, up north, Edgham, we have a great tradition called Coronation Street. And here is a man who is generous to a fault, Alf Roberts. <laughs> His real name, of course, is Brian Mosley. Young Brian. I have a question. Yes. Uh, every week, as you know, I've got to learn a brand new um, uh, script. That's what it's called. Now, now, you know thousands of jokes. How do you remember them? Well, uh, I used... <laughs> Actually, Brian, I use, I use a, a thing called the roll-up technique, where you try to get as many laughs as you can. I try for 7 TPM. Seven titters a minute. Uh, I'll give you an idea. <clears throat> I went to the doctors last week. Nothing wrong, just to make sure you hadn't crossed me off. And so they won't come out and visit you know. You can be as sick as a footballer. And I, I, used to, I was going to play for Liverpool once, but I couldn't spit far enough. So they phoned me up and said, could the doctor come out and visit me, please? They said, visit? You must have lost your conkers. You can have an appointment quarter to six in the morning, three weeks next Thursday. Uh, and I could be dead by then, but if you are, get someone to phone in and cancel the doctor. So, I thought, oh, I can't stand this. I'll pay, I'll pay. So I've joined Bupa. Bupa, B U P A. British underpants prevent acting coughs. <laughs> yeah, if you need a bed bath, the lady comes round with a mop and a bucket. So <laughs> I went down to the doctor's and went into his insulting room. He said, Now, he said, uh, he said, You're paying or shall I hurt you? I said, No, no. <laughs> uh, take all your clothes off. So I took all my clothes off. He went in the next room for a laugh and he <laughs> came back in and he said, You'll have to diet. I said, What colour? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Did you have any difficulty passing water? Some woman, I go over a bridge, I go a bit dizzy. <laughs> oh, did you have vertigo? No, it's only live around the corner. He said, he said you must eat more fibre. I said, I'm a moth. Uh, people do terrible things, you know. Like one fella, there's a fella in Liverpool. He's had four wooden legs making a coffee table. So, <laughs> Little old lady went to the doctor's, little old lady, she said, Doctor, doctor, she said, can I have some more sleeping pills from my husband? He said, why? She said, he's woke up. 
<laughs> now, little old lady goes to the doctor. She said, Doctor, can I have some of them sleeping tablets to make me sleep? He said, Certainly not. He said, I don't believe in any of those tranquilizers. He said, If you can't sleep at night, he said, uh, Do it nature's way, organically. Oh, she said, I can't play one. No, he said, No, look. <laughs> Before you go up to bed at night, she said, have a, have a little tot of something. Oh, she had to do that already, Doctor. He said, oh, yes, yeah. she said. Before I go to bed at night, she said, oh, I always have eight whiskeys, four gins, two vodkas, a large brandy, a martini, and an egg flip. <laughs> Doctor said, you can't sleep. No, she said, I'm up all night singing. <laughs> My dear little diddy friend, David Hamilton, is here, ladies and gentlemen. Over here. David, I remember the very first time I met you, it was at a wedding. You were standing on top of the cake. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I'd like to ask you a question, Ken, if I may. Uh, yes, you've created a great uh, fantasy world. Uh, Naughty Ash, the Jam Booty Mines, and, of course, uh, the Diddy Men. Yes. How did it all start? Well, I, I, was, I, I was a little... When I was a little boy, I used to do, read The Wizard and The Hotspur, you know, The Rover, and at the back in The, in the Wizard, they always had advertisements for... Uh, oh, Paul, you love started like that. Itching powder, stink bombs, sea backroscopes. That's a little thing, a mirror you put in your eye, and, it, and you, for an eight-year-old, it's essential, because you can tell if an assassin is creeping up behind you. <laughs> this, uh, one day, I read one of these advertisements. It said, fool your teachers, amaze your friends, send six minutes in stamps, become a ventriloquist. So I did, didn't I? Yes. He'll tell you. Hi. <laughs> I stop it. Stop squinting. It gives us a migraine. So you, you stick like that. That's why I started. So you. So you've arrived. Yes. Pardon? Yes. Well, squeak up. You've. Uh, <laughs> you've got here. And you've walked all the way? Yes. Must be very tired. Yes. But you're glad to be here? Yes. It's for the kids. <laughs> Can't you say anything else but yes? Yes. What is it? No. <laughs> well, if, you, I, if you've walked all the way, Dickie, you must be very tired and very thirsty. Yes. Would you like a big bottle of brown beer? Watch my lips. A big bottle of brown beer and some brown bread and butter or a shandy? A shandy. <laughs> good, good. I'm very pleased to hear you that you say that. Um, now are you going to do the alphabet backwards? Huh? The alphabet, 26 letters of the alphabet. Are you going to do the alphabet backwards? No. Good, good. Well, I'll tell you what to do. Sing, sing. Sing a little song for the ladies and gentlemen. What would you like to sing? What do you know? <laughs> just, just sing a little song. What would you like to sing? When the red, red rocking, conk, 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 cocking. Conk, conk, cocking. Are you taking the. Yes. Get on with it. Mm. When there are grey skies. Oh. What don't you mind? I don't mind those grey skies. What do I do, Doddy? You, you make them blue. Blue? <laughs> oh, blue. I can't say blue. <laughs> Who the hell's asking you to say glue? I never said a word about glue. <laughs> I can say stick tight. <laughs> What's stick tight got to do with it? Glue. I know it's glue! I know it is! I'm doing the song! You're shouting. I'm not shouting! <laughs> I'm soaking wet. You're not soaking wet, don't you tell me? You're losing your rag. I'm not losing my rag. Just get on with the song. There's no, no glue in this. It's a song about colours. I can say green. I don't really say green either. Get on the song. Just, just do the song as is. As is. Yes, as is, as it is, as it was, as it was, it might... Do the, just, 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 just do the song, as is. As is. Yes. That's <laughs> my name. Sonny boy. <clears throat> <clears throat> Friends may forsake me. Ooh. What can they do, Glue? <laughs> Let them all forsake me. Who have you got in the end? I still have you. What is my name, as is? <laughs> Sonny boy. <laughs> You're sent from heaven. You're right, Doc. I know your worth. You've made 
Frisky ladies, just like you'll all be sitting up in bed tonight and saying, Harry. <laughs> Harry. <laughs> all right then, Charlie. <laughs> so, are you are you very romantic, Mrs? Yes, yes, I can tell you have very dreamy eyes. <clears throat> I should go on Shandy's now if I you think of it. <clears throat> Our next questioner, ladies and gentlemen, is a young lady who's so full of energy. She's a wonderful advertisement for long life batteries. <laughs> they, She's here at the front, Miss Sue Pollard. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hi. <coughs> I've got to tell you, I've never told you this before, but I've often fantasised about you and me oscillating. <laughs> now, please. I mean, let's face it, with them teeth, you could kiss me and nibble me ear all at the same time. Oh, hi, <laughs> but, Kent, seriously, do you think it helps to have a funny face to be a comedian, or don't you mind? <laughs> well, actually, Sue, I can tell you that I am, I am a, I'm a sex symbol for women who don't care. <laughs> when you're a Casanova like me, you have to keep yourself in shape. <laughs> have you seen me in Baywatch? <laughs> I wouldn't mind. I do all the exercises every morning in front of the telly. It's hop down, hop down, hop down, hop down, then the other eyelid. I did I 25 minutes running on the spot this morning. I had my braces caught in the banisters. <laughs> all the gymnasium equipment to put the weights thing. I bought one of those rowing machines, but it sank. So, <laughs> I went to the doctors for a checkup, and the doctors told me, said, I've got to pack up the sumo wrestling, and it uh, yeah, seems I've got nappy rush. <laughs> <laughs> picture now, in your, in your mind's eye, picture now, nothing rude, just picture the human body now, naked and unashamed. How is it all the best bits don't have any bones in? <laughs> <laughs> there are 37 bones in the human neck, more if you're eating kippers. This... <laughs> Over 285 bones in the human body, enough to last the average dog a fortnight. <laughs> As the Irishman said when he saw his x-ray photograph, he said, yes, I don't remember eating all those bones. <laughs> I, think, I think men's legs have a terrible lonely life, don't you? Men's legs, standing in your trousers in the dark all day. <laughs> Just an occasional flash of sunlight. <laughs> when you go to bed tonight. Try it. When you go to bed tonight, sir, take a torch, take a flashlight up to bed at night and make a tent. Uh, <laughs> have you ever done that? Hmm, you want lucky no. Take, <laughs> take one of those coloured flashlights up to bed, shine the green one on your legs, give your wife a nudge and say, hey, Alice, you'll have to lay off the lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> Sciences and doctors, they're making tremendous strides, all, they're working day and night to make sure what, transplants, one of these days, with all the, you could rearrange anything you want, you could have another ear under your arm. Another ear. Frighten the life out of people. Say, I beg your pardon. How dare you? Talk about it? <laughs> what do you mean, five items or less? You can... <laughs> you can have another mouth on the top of your head. Another mouth. When you're late for work in the morning, stick a bacon sandwich under your cap and eat it on the way to the bus. <laughs> you can have a third eye on the end of your finger. <laughs> yeah, well, as I say, this is now the next. <laughs> question comes from every lady's favourite husband, provided she's not married to him. From Coronation Street, it's Peter Baldwin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Young Peter. Young Peter. Young, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm curious. Uh, you may not believe it, but uh, I visit health shops quite a lot. Yeah? yeah. You don't believe it? <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't. No, no, no. no well, yeah. in, in those health shops, they sell such things as natural remedies and herbal potions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Have you ever tried such things? <laughs> oh, yes, it's gone out. And how is it, when you go into these health shops, always, they always smell as if they've got Shergar in the back, don't they? <laughs> 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 Different uh, alternative rem remedies. Yes, I once went into a aromatherapy. Have you heard about it? Aromatherapy. It's based on, you know, uh, smells, pongs, chaps, nips, worsters. And. Uh, <laughs> It's all based on aromatic oils, and see, because see the human being, us human beings, we have a very, very highly developed sense of smell. No, not as highly developed as dogs. Dogs have a very, very. You wouldn't think so. Some of the things they sniff, but they do. <laughs> How would it be if we had the same highly sensitive scent as, as dogs? A lady would stand at the front door half past five at night and say, "Hello, your dad's just got off the bus." <laughs> <laughs> Different. Aromatherapy, different uh, aromatic oils have a very romantic effect. Now, rosemary, for instance. Rosemary is good for a headache. Well, she always had one when I tried, anyway. <laughs> Sandalwood, very good for corns and bunions. Castor oil, very good for athletics. Half a bottle of that, you don't need starting blocks. This... <laughs> My Auntie Nelly, she, she went on this uh, evening primrose oil, you know, oil of evening primrose. <laughs> Took it for a year. She got eaten by a caterpillar. <laughs> For my complexion, I use oil of ule, industrial strength, of course. I... <laughs> Three in one oil, that's very good for loosening nuts. So watch what you're doing there. <laughs> now, I, do, I do have romantic moments. I was walking down the road this morning and this, this young lady came up to me. She said, Hello, handsome, can you tell me the way to the opticians? <laughs> I... I used to think I, I think I was wonderful. I used to think I was marvellous in bed. Then I found out all my girlfriends had asthma. <laughs> so. I was so worried at one time, uh, I thought I'd consult Dr. Ruth. And, uh, <laughs> oh, you seen her, Dr. Ruth? She looks like, she looks like a little prune. Uh, she looks like... She, <laughs> she talks like Sigmund Freud and looks like Clement Freud. Uh, <laughs> I went round to Dr. Ruth's office, and what a woman. There she was, uh, professional to the last, drawing moustaches on Pirelli calendars. Um, <laughs> she, she said... Come inside, she said, come inside. Where have you left your motorbike? Is it 500 cc's? It doesn't matter. Size is not important. <laughs> talk to me, talk to me. She said, I want to hear every mucky little detail of your grubby little mind. She said, tell me first, do you know the difference between men and women? I said, of course, of course they're women. They're the ones with the squeaky voices who dance backwards. Uh, and keep asking for money. They... <laughs> But do you know, she said, do you know how to charm a lady? I heard to charm a woman. Do you know how to make her feel good? I said, of course I do. And by the way, you've got some spinach between your teeth. <laughs> Are you a considerate partner at home? I said, oh, I always lift my feet up when she's hoovering. <laughs> she said, do you know what an erogenous zone is? I said, I know you can't park there after six o'clock. <laughs> Have you ever tried an aphrodisiac? I said, I went out with a Norwegian girl once. She said, do you believe in safe sex? I said, I've got a handrail around the bed. I always try to keep one foot in the ground. Look. She said, what about your libido? I said, I'm going to swap it for a Sierra. It's no good. Said, no. Over here, ladies and gentlemen, we have a fine figure of man, Brian Murphy. Brian Murphy just returned from touring with the Chippendales. He's on the back row, because the lads on the front row complained. This, <laughs> well, <laughs> kept knocking their hats up. They, <laughs> Brian, your question, please. Yes, sir. in the league table uh, of great lovers, yes, yes. you and I have played the game and scored hundreds of times. Of course, of course. <laughs> so, where do you think the British male does he come out on top, or where does he stand or <laughs> lie? <laughs> well, I think British men, British men, if we have a fault, and I doubt it, it is. Oh, come on, now, you wouldn't swap as girls. You wouldn't fancy one of those continental Romeos, would you, ladies? You, you, you would not. You wouldn't. What? It's too far to go with the spare parts, one thing. <laughs> I mean, fancy being married to a Frenchman, a Froggy. They're often French. French are always uh, Frenchmen are always. Uh, you better look the other way, so this, <laughs> this would turn nasty. <laughs>
how can I put it so it won't frighten the ladies? Um, <laughs> Prince Renault was... <laughs> you couldn't stand that, Mrs. You'd be hiding in the gas cupboard all day. Uh, <laughs> sort of shocking, isn't it? Because I know this, you really want to be shocked at it. I can do it. I can do this alternative comedy. Pfft. I was doing alternative comedy when I was four years old. My mother said, pull your trousers up. <laughs> Not all that funny. I don't mind alternative comics, comics as long as they don't start telling jokes. The, did you know... The, <laughs> Did you know that the, that the average Frenchman on a Sunday afternoon would rather <laughs> than watch Match of the Day? Yeah, <laughs> they're not normal like we are. <laughs> if we were in France now, none of these fellas would be in here tonight. They'd all be out. <laughs> the only sense, I'd be with them. I, oh, I'd be holding coats, but I'd be there. I, <laughs> Now it looks like we're stuck with them forever because we've got the Channel Tunnel. What a marvellous achievement, ladies and gentlemen. The Channel for years, this big thing's been boring. Well, a bit like myself, actually. Under <laughs> the English Channel. And then, it was about a year ago, the final breakthrough, did you see on television? That was history being made. You suddenly saw it happen before your eyes. A little four-inch hole appeared in the Channel Tunnel wall. And for the very first time in history, an Englishman reached through and throttled a Frenchman. <laughs> <laughs> They were digging it their side, our lads were filling it in this side. <laughs> they, they eat snails in France, it takes them three hours to get to the bathroom. Um, <laughs> did you know, Mrs., that if a snail was to crawl up your leg, it would be three weeks before you went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> See those French cars? Cars <laughs> look like sheds on wheels. We don't need all these continental cars. I mean, the Volvo, the Swedish car, a lot of people say the Volvo is a bit too heavy. Mostly people have been run over by one. <laughs> I've seen the Irish cars, four steering wheels, one for each passenger. Hello there! <laughs> Get yourself a British Mini Metro, 85 miles per gallon, more if there's two pedalling. <laughs> <laughs> and ladies, you wouldn't fancy one of those handsome Italians with the black wavy hair, would you, ladies? Oh, what a good idea, get it, cherry, very good. What a good idea, get it, very good. Take a good very good, cherry, very good. They creep up behind you when you're doing the sprouts. <laughs> <laughs> Scandinavians? Can big hairy Great Danes, Vikings with horns growing out of their hats and bacon sandwiches strapped to their legs. <laughs> Roaming all round Britain offering housewives free rushes. No, I've no idea what day's round them. <laughs> My sister, she was engaged to an Eskimo, but she broke it off. <laughs> In Germany, all the hymns are hers. And a funny, funny look, German. Germans are always tiling bathrooms. Krauting, they call it. <laughs> and in Russia, everything ends in off, so you've no chance. <laughs> Colin, let's serenade the girls with a continental song. Take me to your heart again. Let's make a start again. Forgiving and forgetting. Take me to your heart. Do you know that's the one word that terrifies men? Again. <laughs> that's the one word that frightens the life out of a man, man. Again. <laughs> I think ladies these days are getting very, very domineering, even a little bit bossy sometimes, aren't they, lads? Yeah. Women these days are going to get a bit too pushy, are they, lads? Yeah. yeah. Well, we're not going to put up with it much longer, are we, lads? <laughs> what are we going to do about it, lads? <laughs> as long as we know what the battle plan is. <laughs> all over Britain, all over Britain, all over Britain at night, men, big men, strong men, are lying alone in bed, trembling with fear under the duvet. Don't leave me, Teddy. <laughs> Big men, macho men, lying, lying in bed, terrified when, when they hear cell block H finishing downstairs. <laughs> and they know that she'll shortly be coming up for a spot of corrective training. <laughs> Powerful men, husbands, that's a man with the nerve taken out. <laughs> Fearful when they hear her getting ready for bed in the bathroom, gargling with Listerine. Terrified when they hear the Estee Lauder and the Avon going on. 
strong men, terrified of that bathroom door opening and she who must be obeyed. <laughs> Wearing one of those pink neglecteds. And a transfer at nighty. Standing there as if she's modelling for scatter cushions. <laughs> Carrying a see-through hot water bottle. Forcing her attentions on him. Forcing her attention. You shouldn't do that, young ladies. You mustn't do that, girls. You mustn't surprise your husband like that. I mean, it doesn't give him time to think of anybody. <laughs> he said, love, love and romance is different all over the world. In France, when a lady's having a romantic interlude, she looks up and she says, oh, sacre bleu. Oh, sacre flippin bleu. <coughs> oh, tu je l'amour, tonight for sure. In Italy, when a lady's having a romantic interlude, she looks up and she says, sempre amore. Molte amore. Sempre amore. <laughs> In Britain, when a lady's having a romantic interlude, she looks up and she said, that ceiling needs doing that. It's all gone flaky. On your own taxi. <laughs> How about a fitted wardrobe from B&Q? <laughs> when are you going to do something about that shed? <laughs> that our jobs need doing in this house and have needed doing for some time. I will have to get a man in. Oh. Colin, play me some romantic music. Soothe the situation. I don't know this one, it's very nice, isn't it? <laughs> Transport us to a land of beautiful love songs. Who will ever remember Ivan Avello's? I've caught my lilacs in the spring again. <laughs> Oh, romantic ballads that can set men's pulses racing. I can't get over a girl like you. So get up and make the tea yourself. <laughs> there are tears on my pillow. The rest of the bed seems all right. <laughs> finding a new comic talent, ladies and gentlemen, is like finding a diamond. And this lad, he comes straight from Ratner's. This... <laughs> A wonderful new comedian from Liverpool, Mr. John Martin. John Martin. Ken, I'd like to ask a question. I've seen you work so many times, and you seem to bridge the generation gap with laughter. Mm -hmm. What do you really think of the young generation? Well, I, I think, no, I think young people today are very nice, really. Taking the right way, by the throat. <laughs> <laughs> They laugh at us, you know. If they laugh at the teenagers, they call us wrinklies. Wrinklies? How dare they? How would they like it if we call them zitsies? <laughs> <laughs> Next time one of them gets on your wick, just say, hello, zitsy. <laughs> <laughs> How's your pimps? Acne, <laughs> <laughs> acne, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> <laughs> and one word the teenagers can't stand, you know, clear a silk. <laughs> What is a teenager? A teenager is somebody who leaves the house at night in a car and comes back in the police van. Yes. <laughs> but you mustn't argue with them. You see fathers arguing with their 15-year-old sons. They say, uh, uh, son, son, <laughs> son, can you spare me a moment, son? <laughs> uh, have I ever struck you, son? <laughs> no, you must talk to young people, listen. You must talk to young people, ladies and gentlemen, and we must listen to what they're saying. This is what I do all over the country when I'm touring as part of my social conscience. I try to meet as many young people as I can, and I talk to them, and I listen to what they're saying. What's a pillock? <laughs> It's the same as a plunker, is it really? Oh. Well, I knew I'd always known I was a plunker. I didn't know it was a pillock as well, though. <laughs> well, I flatter myself. I get them very well, young people. As a matter of fact, they, they call me a Richard Head. And, uh, <laughs> I'll do this time. <laughs> Hello, old Richard Head, they shout. <laughs> Go off. Or oh, words to that effect. <laughs> The vicar said to me last Sunday, he said, Kenneth, isn't it wonderful to see the young people walking down the road carrying the good book? I said, they're taking their videos back then. <laughs> <laughs> they hire these blasted videos all about werewolves and vampires. Fancy, fancy anybody paying good money to watch somebody with long hair and big teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting over here, ladies and gentlemen, I can see the absolutely beautiful Jane Horrocks from Absolutely Fabulous. <laughs> Lovely Jane. Hi, Ken. 
Um, how, how do you manage to keep topical with your jokes? I mean, do you use the newspapers? Uh, do I use the newspapers? <laughs> <laughs> We're pretty primitive up north, but not that. <laughs> that was my job, cut him into little squares. <laughs> There's always plenty of new jokes, Jane. People say whether new there are as many new jokes every day as there are people doing daft things, and we all do daft things, don't we? Yeah. Just keep your eyes open and your ears open, and you'll hear. I mean, a news item, for instance, a news item tonight. Uh, Jeremy Paxman was bitten by a dog on his way to the studio tonight, but after being inje given injections and treatment for shock, the dog was allowed to go home. <laughs> The ones, the ones I like best in the newspapers are the advertisement columns. <clears throat> you know, for sale, vaulting pole, slightly imperfect, would suit enthusiastic midget. <laughs> for sale, 300 copies of Playboy magazine and assorted sex toys. Would exchange for Zimmer frame and orthopedic bed. <laughs> Personal column. Short, squat, ugly, bald-headed pensioner wishes to meet tall, wealthy, beautiful blonde with a view to a warm, passionate relationship. Sense of humour essential. <laughs> Personal column. Arthur, I think of you every night as I lie waiting for your touch. P.S. I'm on the other side of the bed. Your wife, Doris. <laughs> this, this is what happens there. How does a man... How does a man know when he's growing old? Comes on you all of a sudden, you know. It's all right for you, ladies. A man has to realise he's growing old. Little things tell him. It's... Do you mind, please? <laughs> a man's life is like a long journey. And during his lifetime, a man has to travel so many weary miles, down lanes, crossing plains, climbing mountains and fording rivers. And all the time during his life, a man is searching. Oh, he's searching for the truth. And then one day, everything starts to click. Your neck, your back... <laughs> Fall out of bed in the morning, you sound like a maraca band. <laughs> and your, your wife's in the bathroom going, cha cha cha, cha cha cha. You get no sympathy when you're not well. You're not going to be off work, are you? <laughs> a man has to realise he's not as young as he used to was. In the autumn of his life, there are signs and posters that tell him you get out of breath playing chess. <laughs> your wedding suit comes back into fashion. <laughs> you use both hands to clean your teeth. You still chase after girls, but you can't remember why. <laughs> and your wife doesn't mind you chasing after girls, because she, she says, our dog chases after cars and he can't drive. <laughs> you wake up one morning and find you've got a bald-headed son. <laughs> your wife makes you wear dark trousers when you go out. down the road like that. You can't go like that. Go and stand by the fire for ten minutes. Go on. <laughs> Here, I'll use the hair dryer on it. All right. When you do go out, when you do go out, people start helping you onto the bus. When you just got off the blasted thing. <laughs> now, ladies, ladies never grow old, do you girls? No. You look so beautiful tonight. And you always will look beautiful, ladies. Ladies are always beautiful. But you'll know you're knocking on just a little bit, girls, because at Christmas time, Everybody gives you lavender bath cubes for Christmas. <laughs> Your family start taking you home early from parties. exercise your chuckle muscle every day and have a good old laugh, or better still, make somebody else laugh, you'll always stay young and frisky and healthy. But if you don't use your chuckle muscle, it dries up and drops off. <laughs> and tonight, here tonight, I, we've heard the most beautiful sound in the world, the sound of laughter and happiness. Forget all your troubles. I'm fully paid up now to 1975. <laughs> <laughs> you still write to me. <laughs> 
they said they'd keep in touch. <laughs> I got a Christmas card from him. He said, "'Tis more blessed to give than to receive." <laughs> 200 years we've been paying this, like 200, 200 years ago, this balmy MP, he's sitting along there in Westminster one afternoon, he's got nothing to do. He thinks I know, he said, I know, I'll invent income tax. Yeah, I'll invent income tax, and so he did, 200 years ago. In those days, it was tuppence in the pound. I thought it still was. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being a wonderful thank you thank you thank you for being a touchy hilarious and a plumptious audience we wish you good health the time to enjoy it and lots and lots of happiness 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 the greatest gift that we possess I thank the law that I've been blessed with more than my share of happiness. Here we go now! To me, this world is a wonderful place. I'm the luckiest human in the human race. I've got no silver and I've got no gold, but I've got happiness in my soul. Happiness to me is ocean tide, a sunset fading on a mountainside. A big old heaven full of stars above When I'm in the arms of the one I love Oh, happiness, come on, happiness The greatest gift that we possess I thank the Lord that we've been blessed With more than 